Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Spidey Dude Experience. I'm Zach Joyner, your friendly neighborhood webmaster and host of the program. If you're watching this video, thank you for watching. This is a pre-recorded episode. We are talking with Greg Wiseman. And uh, as a result of us our discussions with Greg, um, we decided to pre-record it talking about the Spectacular Spider-Men series. Really looking forward to it. But before we get started, I wanted to thank our patrons over at patreon.com slash Network. Patrons such as... Allison, Cindy, Ed, Georgia, Janelle, Gr- Jessica, Jurgen, Catherine, Kale, Laura Howard, Lup Moose, Master Dramon, Phoenician, Scott, Vanessa, Vicky, and Winnipeg Webhead. Thank you guys for your support as sensational $5 patrons. Then we have our $15 patron, Sarah. She's our spectacular patron, so spectacular Sarah. And then we have our VIPs, Scott, Sebastian, and Vinkman, we have our friendly neighborhood tier as well. You see them up on the screen. We thank them for their support over on Patreon. You want to see what all the fuss is about? You can go join for free for the first seven days over at patreon.com slash Network. All right, if you have not already checked out our other fine programs here on the channel and on the network, you can go over to spidey-dude.com and find all of the audio editions. we got the Clone Saga Chronicles and Spectacular Radio. Those are our Vault Series shows that started, uh, that are completed shows. The Spectacular Radio is probably one that you'll want to check out with this episode, considering we're talking with Greg Wiseman, and that's where our relationship really started, was on that show talking about the Spectacular Spider-Man animated series. Amazing Spider-Man Classics is a show all about Spidey from the beginning. Uh, Our current season is a father and son duo talking about it from the beginning. The Sabi Sima era Spectacular Podcast is a show all about Spectacular Spider-Man Seminoles Salvia Sima run on the Salvia Sima seminal run on the spectacular Spider Man. It's a great, great show. Talk hosted by Chris Devin. Then we have Voices from the Area Gargoyles podcast, is a show all about Gargoyles animated series that ran in 1994. Obviously, it's one that would be very important to this episode. And there's a big announcement at the end of this episode that you'll, you'll definitely be interested in hearing more about. The Slot Symposium is this, about Dan Slot's seminal run on Spider-Man, talking about it from the beginning, from the perspective of it being a completed run, instead of talking about it as it came out. Has my opinions changed? Who knows? That's what it's all about. It's a collaboration with the Comic Binge YouTube channel, which if you haven't checked that out, link's down in the description below. And of course, Make Mine Mayday is the show all about Spider-Girl and her world. It is hosted by myself and Kelly McDaniel. It is the sister show to this particular program here on YouTube. And, of course, finally, our show all about the Kirkoan era of X-Men is our Patreon first show, hosted by myself and Neil Bogenreiter. So, uh, like I say, this episode is one that I've been really excited to bring forth to you. Looking forward to it. So without further ado, let's get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Spidey Dude Experience. I'm Zach Joyner, your friendly neighborhood webmaster of Spidey-Dude.com and executive producer of the Spidey Dude Radio Network. This episode, we are doing things slightly different. You're kind of looking at a different view this time. Uh, It's because we got some special guests on the show. First up, we got a host of Voices from the Eria Gargoyles podcast, Mr. Greg Bishansky. Greg, hello. Hi, and former co-host of Spectacular Radio, which is part of the reason why I'm here. I know, right? Spectacular Radio, the Spectacular Spider-Man animated series. And of course, we got our producer, Neil. Hello, Neil. Hi, it's great to be here. I even put on my polo shirt because I knew it was a special occasion. Oh, there you go. (laughs) And uh, Neil's the host of Books of X. That is our Patreon first show over on patreon.com slash Spidey Network. And of course, we have Mr. Javier Trujillo. Hello, Javi. Did I screw it up again? Lightly. There we go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I never can get your last name right. Uh, it's all good, brother. Host it's of only been classics here on the channel. Hello, eighteen hello. years. It's fine. It's all- <laughs> hey everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but tonight, uh, as fun it is to, to introduce those three gentlemen, uh, we have a very special guest. He is the writer of the brand new Marvel comic. The Spectacular Spider-Man. We talked about it on a previous episode of the show, and we have the writer extraordinaire, Greg Wiseman. Hello, Greg. Hi. Glad to be Welcome here. Welcome back to the Spidey Dude Radio Network. You've, well, you, you never really left. Places. You never left. <laughs> I never really left. <laughs> but 
Uh, it's good to have you on this show. Uh, I've, I've been looking forward to this for a while. Uh, as soon as I heard the news, we were like, man, we got to have Greg on to, to talk about this title because I am legitimately excited. And I, and I think my cohorts are all equally ex as excited as I am as well. So, um, yeah. So tell us a little bit, how did this come about? This was uh, kind of not something that was really on anybody's radar. And then it popped up and everybody's like, oh, sweet, it's Greg. And it's him doing Spider-Man again. Uh, it, it wasn't on my radar either. Uh, the truth is that, um, uh, Nick Lowe, editor of, uh, the Spidey titles contacted me, um, pretty much out of the blue. I didn't know Nick before. Um, though I, I know him now. I like him a lot. He's a nice guy. Uh, and his, uh, assistant editor, Caden, um, is a Gargoyles fan and had been reading the Gargoyles comic books that I've been doing for Dynamite and liked them um, and mentioned that to Nick. And Nick remembered that I'd done two seasons of the Spectacular Spider-Man and he liked the show and he thought, um, hey, we're doing this book with uh, Peter and Miles and we've got this artist, Umberto Ramos and I'm like yes I like I he didn't even have to <laughs> he kept trying to sell it to me and I kept going I I you you had me at at spider you know I mean you didn't even have to finish the, the is thing. it like is it like the um, meme where Harry is like but Peter and in Peter x thing is gonna cause bad thing and Peter's like Harry or Harry you don't have to threaten me with a good time uh, I'm not familiar with that meme, but sure. Oh. Uh, I'm going to say yes. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm going to, the, you know, he and I started talking about, Nick and I started talking about it. And, um, and you know, uh, Peter and Miles each have their own book. So like, you know, the, the deep stuff that's going on in their personal lives, that's not going to be this book's, uh, you know, uh, proving grounds, you know. Uh, who they're dating, that kind of thing, you know, uh, who they're, uh, all this intense personal stuff, obviously going to be in each of their individual titles, right? So we talked about it and, um, and uh, came up with this idea that, uh, that I wanted to evolve uh, Peter and Miles out of the mentor protege role that they've been at since the two universes combined, right? Um, and I want to get them to the point where they're friends. And one thing I want to contrast a little bit, um, not because I don't like it, I love the two Spider-Verse movies, but the Peter Miles relationship there, well, that's a much older Peter. That's a guy in his... Um, probably I'd guess late 30s right you know um and Miles is 16 but in the Mar the main Marvel universe Peter is sort I mean Miles is sort of an eternal 16 right I mean eventually I don't know what they'll do long term but uh, you know at this he's been 16 now for 20 years at this point more or less um uh maybe he's there at a year or two um was he 14 when it started I can't even remember but uh but at this yeah, point, yeah, I was around 14. for quite some time. And Peter's about 26, 27, 28, give or take. And he's been that for like 40 years, right? So uh, maybe 50, if I think about it, right? Uh, and Definitely since the 80s, yeah, 40. Um, yeah. And so they're only 10 years apart. It's not, it's not like in, in uh, the Spider-Verse movies where there's, there's like, they're a full generation apart. These guys aren't that far apart in age. And so we decided that Peter was gonna say to Miles, hey, let's just get together every Wednesday. And Miles is like, you know, for a team up, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll find someone to, and no, he was like, no, 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 no. Let's just have coffee. Oh, you mean we'll, we'll, we'll sit up on top of the Empire State Building? No, no, let's just go to a coffee shop in civilian clothes and have coffee. No spider stuff. Just two guys who are friends checking in with each other every once in a while. 
And that led us to, okay, well, where are they going to go? And um, so we came up, uh, or uh, uh, Nick talked about it, let's do a coffee shop. I said, well, let's do the coffee shop on uh, the ESU campus, um, the coffee bean at ESU. That's Pete's alma mater, so he's got a connection to it. It's a school that Miles is really interested in matriculating to, so he got a connection to it. And they just go for coffee, right? Um, and, but you know, it's a Spider-Man comic, so the shit hits the fan pretty quickly, actually. But, um, <laughs> but right. what this is about is establishing them as not just mentor and protege, but actually as friends. Um, so what you see is, uh, I think that's unique about this book is Miles is, you know, this is his older friend. So he's, he's trying to be super mature and all this sort of stuff for Peter. It's like, Hey, I'm hanging out with a 16 year old. I'm going to let my inner 16 year old out. So you've got this kind of role reversal in terms of who's being the mature partner in this friendship but what it's really about is again evolving them beyond this very straightforward mentor protege relationship into them being equals and friends and we just got started talking about this and decided and started talking about building a supporting cast at the coffee shop so that it feels more like cheers you know where everybody knows your name we'd have a couple baristas we'd have regular customers there and we would build that cast um, at this coffee shop. Um, and so we're in that same Marvel universe, you know, the main Marvel universe, but I, I'm not dealing with Peter's supporting cast. I'm not dealing with Miles' supporting cast. We've created our own little bubble so to speak, um, of, of people in their lives that they hang out with. And um, it's just become really fun. Having said all that, the thing that most matters is that Umberto Ramos is drawing this book. <laughs> and it looks so effing good that I could write a shopping list and it would still be worth uh, buying. Uh, I like to think I'm doing a little better than a shopping list, but in any case, the stuff that Umberto's doing is so gorgeous um, that uh, the art alone makes purchasing this book. I mean, getting him back on Spider-Man, Spider-Men, um, you know, makes the whole thing worthwhile. It is just a joy. He, he sends me a, a penciled page just about, you know, every day or so. And I just get this big grin on my face because um, it looks so terrific. I um, just turned in yesterday or two days ago, I guess, Monday, <clears throat> um, the script for issue four. Um, okay. I'm seeing, I just saw today the last of the color on issue two. Um, Berto's about halfway through, just over halfway through penciling issue three so we're we're rolling um and uh and this and i'm excited about it. just to be just to be clear on this this is an ongoing this is not a mini series this is not you know 12 ish this this is intended to be an ongoing for the foreseeable future i mean it's ongoing it, it, it at the end of the day it's about sales you know i mean it, it, it it'll be right. a short ongoing series if sales aren't good <laughs> but um uh, you know, shorter than a mini series if sales aren't good. But, um, but yes, this is uh, this is designed to be an ongoing comic. It'll go as long as sales, um, you know, merit it. Um, and I'm on for the long haul. I don't know how long that haul will be, but we're hopeful. Uh, the original title of the book was Spider Man and Spider Man, and I suggested the new title. Um, really. Uh, based on greed um yeah that's fair i said i said if we call this book the spectacular spider-man with me attached to it that's going to attract more attention 
than just Spider-Man and Spider-Man. And um, Marvel, uh, Nick immediately saw the logic in that. It took Marvel, I think, an extra beat to uh, get that idea across, but they uh, came around pretty quick. And so I'm very happy with the title of the book. Um, it makes me smile also. Um, but yeah, it was it was really like, I think this will help us sell a few more copies of issue one. Then, you know, people will see the book and decide whether it's something they want to keep reading. I like to think they will. I think the first issue is really fun, and I think it only gets better from there. Um, but uh, again, Umberto Ramos doing Spider-Man. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> you know, as somebody that has read his stuff since the beginning and seen how his art has evolved over the years and, and you know, when they when he was a part of the rotating artists on when they were doing multiple issues of Spider-Man a month, it, it, like, I, I remember in 2011 being in San Diego and he's sitting there doing pages and I just felt bad for him because I'm like, man, that 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 schedule is demanding. But when you get him on like a like a once a month book, it just allows his his artwork to even shine more. It was good th with the other way, but like once a month, I, I see the ha ha the difference in the artwork and the, and the more details he's able to put into oh, it's it's uh what he his acting i mean the acting that he puts into his characters uh the humanity that he puts in to his characters and i'm talking about you know legacy characters original characters um that that he and i have created together uh um there's a big mix of those in this uh title and um, what he's doing with all these characters is just, uh, it's gorgeous. And there are moments that are um, heartbreaking and moments that are just so funny. And uh, uh, again, it, it uh, I, I like to think I'm doing a good job, but he's just knocking it out of the park, page after page after page. So um, I'm always I'm curious that you mentioned the the new supporting cast. Is there any influence from like the '90s comics where we had the coffee bean that Ben Riley worked at, and they had familiar patrons and staff as well? Did you take any inspiration from that, or is this completely your own invention? Uh, so indirectly, uh, I what I'm taking inspiration from is the coffee bean that we did uh, what we didn't call it the coffee bean it was the the silver spoon silver spoon yeah on spectacular so i'm taking okay. inspiration from that but that took some inspiration from the 90s coffee bean so it's a little i guess if you're talking about the coffee's been watered down, I guess, from that. <laughs> but like, I think like, we've like... got a good, strong brew uh, now. We've got a, a, a great group of characters. Some of them are characters, uh, are the the main Marvel Universe version of some characters I, uh, of a character that I did in uh, Spectacular. Hmm. Um, there are some characters that I, I don't know if you guys remember or if you even knew. Uh, I know. Bashansky did, but uh, I I wrote a six issue comic for Marvel called Star Brand and Night Mask, which was set at ESU, um, mm -hmm. and so I pulled a couple of characters that were original to Star Brand and Night Mask and put them in uh, in this, uh, not Star Brand or Night Mask, but a couple of the supporting characters from that book I scooped up and used here because they felt like they really fit and I liked them and didn't get to do much with them back in the day. Um, there are some legacy characters that go all the way back to the Ditko days um, in this book. Uh, and, you know, and some particular favorites of mine. Um, we're not, we're trying not to overwhelm. Uh, we introduce the characters gradually because we don't want to hear, here are 20 characters, memorize their names. We'll test you on it later. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're not doing that. Uh, but, you know, we're Just gradually... Just give us some caption bots. Yeah, we're gradually growing this uh, group of characters and we're having a good time with it. And uh, um, and 
this is in essence home base for this book, you know, and it's, <laughs> it's weird because it's pretty much only on Wednesdays. Um, it, you know, it's a uh, <laughs> Thursday through Tuesday, they're in their own titles, but Wednesdays are mine. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, so we're we're having some fun with that. Was that part um, of the, was that part of the negotiation? Like you went to uh, Zeb Weld and Cody's group, like, okay, listen, you guys can have every other day of the week, but Wednesdays they have to be in my title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but whatever you're doing, make sure that they've survived it by Wednesday. No, I didn't have any negotiations. <laughs> There, you know, I, I'm very concerned. I want to make sure that nothing I do. Look, they've got the main titles. Um, I don't want to step on uh, Zebra Cody's toes. You know, I, I want to make sure that anything I'm doing. So, you know, I'm I'm constantly checking with Nick and Caden and making sure, hey, is this cool? You know, um, and we've had a lot of conversations. I had a trip to New York uh, and had lunch with Nick. Um, and so we've had a lot of conversations about this and, and, um, you know, I, uh, I definitely am game to be a team player. Uh, so I, you know, don't take anything I say too literally, but yeah, pretty much Wednesdays are mine. <laughs> <laughs> nice so, okay i have a question so spidey and his world have changed a lot in the years since you have la last wrote the character what were the biggest changes and adjustments you had to make in how you approached him and and his world uh you know from a personality standpoint uh and i don't want to pretend or or i'm not really title aside trying to trick the audience into thinking that this is somehow a continuation of the tv show it is not this is the main Marvel Universe Spidey. But, you know, every writer has to sort of glean in on his interpretation of the character. And for me, um, you know, I hear Josh Keaton's voice when I write Spider-Man. I don't think that's a shock to anybody. Um, and so from a personality standpoint, this is very much uh, an extension. You know, my Peter Parker in Spectacular was 16 years old. This guy's 26, 27, somewhere in that range. So he's older, but he's also kind of being a goofball because he feels free to be a goofball because he's hanging out with a 16. Um, and so I'm letting some of that younger Spidey that I'm used to writing come through, but through the prism of the older character. So he's being a goof, but um but he kind of knows it you know uh and that's fun um there are uh probably a hundred little things but there's nothing big i mean you know uh, i've never written miles before but i've been enjoying miles for years uh and i'm sure i'm influenced by the two spider-verse movies i'm sure i am um because you know I've been reading Miles on and off for quite a bit, but but those movies loom very large in my imagination and memory. And so they're easy to sort of uh, latch onto in terms of how to uh, interpret Miles. Um, and uh, otherwise, you know, I'm constantly writing Nick and Caden with questions like, uh, so where was this character left off? Is, is this character dead, still dead or is it, uh, he alive again, um, or, you know, uh, am I free to use this character or is that character off limits and, or send me a list of villains that fit these particular criteria that I'm allowed to use. Um, and there's a lot of that going on, but, um, you know, at, at, at this point, I'm, I'm just trying to do a kind of cl a classic archetypal version of both Pete and Miles, but how they relate to each other as opposed to Peter alone, Miles alone. And again, this is not their, I'm not dealing with their professional lot. You know, what do they do to make money? I'm not, you know, the parents, Miles' parents are in there a little, but it's not really about his relationship with his parents his friends at school, his school, 
It's not about what Peter's doing to make a living. It's not about his love life. It, it, it's about these two friends. And that frees me up, honestly. And it wasn't a plan. It's just how it's worked out. It frees me up from a lot of continuity because uh, uh, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm intentionally, because it's not my purview, um, not dealing with the day-to-day -day of their lives. I'm dealing with, hey, we get together once a week to hang out because we like each other's company. And the coffee here is good. And there are good people working here and good people who hang out here. So, um, and oh yeah, look, we have to go switch into our Spidey suits because there's a, there is a crisis. Because um, isn't there always? Um, oh, oh, you know. Then it becomes a chicken and the egg or the egg question. Neil, you had a question? Mm -hmm. Well, I think he actually kind of answered it earlier, but um, you mentioned this is relatively self-contained because um, the gang war storyline is kind of seen not necessarily a fracturing, but kind of a tensing of Peter and Miles' relationship. So I'm assuming that's not going to kind of impact their relationship within both the opening of the story as well as its continuation. So uh, I'm I'm reading the gang war as it comes out, um, and I've definitely noticed that you know, there's this response that Miles has to Peter sort of ditching him for this period of time, which which I assume the readership knows is because Peter was in another dimension or uh, for what was for him a short period of time, but for everyone else was weeks and weeks, right? And I think it's interesting so far in the gang war that every time they've sort of had that tension about that, that Peter hasn't stopped and said, hey, this is what happened. It was completely beyond my control. I was gone for two minutes, and for you, it was two years. I mean, that's not the math right, but you get the basic idea, right? Right. Um, and I'm interested to see if Peter at some point stops and tells him this, because clearly by the time you get to my book, um, things are are good between them. I mean, they're, they're not... Uh, the relationship grows during my issues, but it doesn't start out in a bad place. It doesn't start out in a perfect place. It's not like they're completely in sync. That's starting to happen as with each issue that I do, but um, they're not at odds. They're not um, crashing into each other. And if I'm being honest, one of the reasons for that is I assumed when I wrote issue one, before I had read some of these gang war issues where they're tense with each other, that Peter would have told him this by this time. <laughs> so I didn't even deal with that. Cause I'm like, right. why would I bring that up? You know, because by this time he would have told him and Miles would have gone, oh dude, I'm so sorry, that's horrible. Uh, and I, oh man, I've been kind of a jerk to you. And, and Peter's like, look, there's no way you could have known. I should have told you sooner, but it was just so painful. So I just assumed that conversation would have happened already. Ooh. So to be reading Gang War and to find out, oh, it clearly has not happened yet. I'm kind of interested to see if it happens by the end of this thing. Um, and if it <laughs> doesn't, then you just have to assume it happened off screen, uh, off panel, uh, off page, sometime between the end of Gang War and the first issue of Spider-Man. Um, so, you know, as with any shared universe that has multiple writers it's not always a hundred percent in sync but i think you can make it work you know in a marvel no price style uh one way or another uh so i i think i don't think the continuity is wrong it's just either incomplete up to this point or you've got to assume there's a scene that took place off screen yeah like you can connect the dots and kind of just assume oh they they got over it <laughs> yeah, they're, right. they're friends now <laughs> yeah i mean they're, they're you know they're they've got ways to go but i really have made that the focus of i know i sound like a broken record but um the desire of both these guys to evolve the relationship beyond where it started um and you see that you know in the first page of every issue of miles book you know the inside front cover of miles book talks about how in essence, Peter was his inspiration and he became Spider-Man um, out of that. And so it's like, okay, that's great. And that's true, but let's 
see if these two as human beings can go beyond that at some point. And I know this has been true in my life. There, there have been people in my life who mentored me. And at some point, um, you hope that that evolves. You'll always be grateful for the mentoring, but at some point you hope that evolves into an actual friendship of equals. And, um, and in, with some of those mentors with me, it, it has. And then there are some um, people uh, who mentored me, or at least one I can think of whose name I won't mention, but who can't get past it. Like still, I mean, I'm 60 years old and this guy still talks to me, even though he's only six years older than I am. Like I was this 25 year old kid at DC Comics in, in 1987, you know? Um, and he's just like, okay. Um, and so with that awareness, anyone that I've tried to be a, in any way a mentor to, I try to also evolve that those relationships um, beyond where it started to something that's more akin to just, uh, let's just be friends now. You don't owe me anything, let's just be friends. Um, and so that I think is where the inspiration for that comes from for me is that this is something that exists in my life in both directions. And I wanna see that in Peter and Miles. I wanna see them grow beyond it. So how was it coming back to Spider-Man? We, we talked with uh, J.M. Mateus, writer of Craven's Crazy, Crazy Last Hunt and a bunch of stuff. And he was coming back to the character after a little while. And it's like, he's like, oh, it's just like seeing an old friend you know, in his mind's eye. Was that kind of the same thing for you getting to write Spider-Man? Because you've not written a ton of Spidey outside of the series. I know you did a backup a number of years ago during Brand New Day, but not yeah, a lot. Wait, it wasn't a backup when I wrote it, but it ended up being a backup. Um, oh. <laughs> oh. Uh, Matt, tell uh, us that story in a minute. I'd I, I like to hear that. <laughs> there's no story. It's just, you know, it was going to be a, a, a fill-in issue. It was going to be an issue, and then I guess they didn't need the fill in. So they just said, oh. all right, we'll do a double size issue and put this is the second story. And I was like, okay. Um, but I didn't know it was when I wrote it, I didn't know it was a backup story. It was just a story. Uh, I, by the way, I loved writing that story. Uh, that was great. But uh, um, oh, I loved my buddy, loved you, you reintroducing Shashan with Flash's. Uh, as Flash's physical therapist, he thought that was awesome. You can drop his name. It was Josh for Tony. We all know it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my my good buddy Josh, who who is who is uh, openly mocked the old uh, those old spectacular issues where Shashad showed up. <laughs> but she, he loves the character. It's just some of the writing back then was. Whew. I am a huge Shashan fan, um, as anyone who watched Spectacular knows. And yeah, I put her into both that one issue of Spider-Man that I wrote and also into Starbrand and Night Mask because I like Shashad that much. Um, so I'm going to give you a spoiler here. Shashan is a regular at the Coffee Bean on the ESU Caiaphas and she is part of the supporting cast. So um, that, that is cool. Because um, I am I am honestly a massive Shashan fan. <laughs> Going back to my childhood when she first uh, first appeared way back in the day. I'm um, literally reading these books right now in a read through on Marvel Unlimited, and I, so it, that's that's awesome. So it's, it's like fresh on my mind because I'm reading it right now. So all the time uh, it is to answer your question, uh, it is like being back with old friends. Uh, uh, I love writing Peter. I am having a blast writing miles as well um so it's nice because there's this uh equal balance of a character i'm very very familiar with and a character that i'm familiar with as a reader and a viewer but have never written myself and then again another mix of characters some of which came before uh some of which are brand new um so it's not dissimilar to what I'm doing, I mean, emotionally in my head, to what I'm doing on the Gargoyles comics. It is just great to be in this playground again um, and playing with these toys and, and being with old friends, whether it's Goliath or Elisa or Peter Parker and Shashan Wen. Um, 
it uh, this stuff uh, you know uh, is seminal for me in terms of my uh, the way my brain works you know it, it and um, obviously you know I go back with Peter to before you were all born um and um and and so for me uh again just as when we did the show spectacular spider-man um that was a dream come true for me because i love those characters um i truly um love peter and i love his supporting cast and it's such a rich cast of characters um, and he has one of the best rogues gallery ever. Um, and yeah. uh, uh, and so it's great, but I also really appreciate that um, this book makes me stretch because, you know, Miles is a character I'm not familiar with writing. I don't want, you know, I'm an old white guy. Uh, I don't want to pretend that Miles is, uh, uh, you know, growing up in Brooklyn is something uh, that is out of my personal experience. So I'm working really hard to get his voice right, to get his uh, energy right. Um, and, uh, you know, it'll be up to the reader to judge whether I'm doing a decent job at it or not. But uh, I, I feel like I'm feel like I'm doing okay and uh Nick and Umberto and everybody seem pretty happy with it so uh we just have to wait and see if the fans agree I guess but I so like having both something I'm comfortable with and something that I'm stretching to do it's a great writing feeling exercise that's awesome uh, is there a lot of coordination between you and, and the other writers or is there like a big email chain or is it just you mainly dealing with no. Nick? No, I, I, okay. I haven't, I don't know Zeb or Cody. Uh, I mean, I, I know their work, um, but I don't know them. Uh, and I've had no direct communication with them. I'm not saying that won't change over time. Um, right. You know, right now we're in the middle of the gang war. We all know that in a year or so, there'll be some other big crossover event that involves the spider cast and maybe i'll be part of that i'd be happy to be part of that but um you know gang war will be over by the time my book starts so i didn't have to you know i, I wasn't involved in any of that so there was no need for me to sort of be uh on a chain with all these guys and going okay you're doing this and we'll do this over here in brooklyn and you do that in uptown and uh we'll do that in chinatown I mean, I'm not part of it, but I can guess what it's been like for them to, <laughs> to coordinate, you know, uh, 18 issues or whatever it is across six titles or seven titles. Um, that must have been a massive uh, logistical puzzle. Um, you know, forget the creative side of it, just the logistics of it was huge. And I don't know that from experience yeah. on Gang War. I know that from doing that sort of shit other times and uh and i know that it's it's hard but my book was starting after that gang war ended so i just had no involvement in that whatsoever but down the road who knows and i'd be happy to work with them um uh if and when uh again the book has to sell well enough to survive so we'll start with that pre-order pre-order that book so part of the reason we're doing this in january and even though the book comes out in march is because we want everybody to know cut off by the by, by the book by the you got till the end of the month to uh submit it for your comic shops so or you can find it on on comiXology kindle so that is also an alternative that i know that they look at so so i've got a kind of a silly little question um you know you, you mentioned drawing inspiration from uh, mostly the Spider-Verse movies, but also um, kind of keeping up with uh, Ziggler's Miles run. Um, Venom Blast or Venom Sword? Kind of want your input on this. Mm -hmm. uh, Does he even know what you're saying? Oh, no. I do know what you're saying. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I do know what you're saying. Uh, you're talking about my preference? Or... I Either preference or 
I don't know if it's a spoiler if what's going to be in the book. Uh, both. Well, there you go. All right. Um, that that answers that question, Bobby. Yeah. What what you got? Although honestly, I'm I'm not leaning in to that probably as much as I. I probably should lean into it a little more than I am, but mostly I'm just having fun with a lot of arachnobatics, you know, a lot of them. Uh -oh. There's a lot of, it's, I mean, given the artist I have, uh, there's a, just, it's about movement. Uh, we really, I, I want this book to just be about a lot of movement. There's a lot of webbing going on. I mean, a lot of webbing going on. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's web heavy. Um, so, uh, I probably should take more advantage of, uh, what's unique about Miles power set. I do use it a little bit, but I'm mostly, um, just focusing on, or up to this point have been focusing on, uh, um, what they have in common power wise, as opposed to what separates them. Yeah, that makes sense. I don't know if it makes sense, but that's what I've been doing. Bobby <laughs> Javi, you got a question? Yeah, it's pretty clear, Greg, from your spectacular Spider-Man uh, show that you have like a deep love and affection for like the Lee Ditko Romita era. Like there's a lot of little Easter eggs and references, not just to that, but, you know, through the whole of Spidey's history. Uh, but when it comes to Miles, because he is so new, do you have a favorite story arc or two that have influenced your writing? Um, yeah, I mean, the short answer is, uh, no, um, because my, um, I've been in and out of comics so much over the mm -hmm. years. Um, you know, you writing Spectacular Spider-Man in, when was that? 2008-ish, seven, eight, nine, those years. Um, yeah. so I'm reading tons and tons of Marvel comics then. Then I go over to Warner Brothers to do Young Justice. And so I'm reading a ton, a ton of DC comics and I don't have time to read a lot of Marvel comics. So I have big gaps here and there. Um, and um, so some of big chunks of Miles's career, so to speak, fall into those gaps. Um, so I've read a bunch of Miles comics and I've been uh, reading a bunch, uh, both keeping up with the new stuff, but also going back and reading old stuff with nick sort of curating for me um okay. what he thinks is is the most important stuff but if i'm being honest probably without a doubt the biggest influence for me in terms of miles are the movies because um uh i knew who miles was and i'd read a bunch of miles comics but they'd been a scattershot is probably a good word mm -hmm. to describe my I have an encyclopedic knowledge of certain characters. I did not have that for Miles. Um, so I've been trying to uh, fix that as I go. But, you know, once I accepted the gig, we had to hit the ground running. There wasn't time to yeah. sort of say, this is good, but give me six months to read everything, and then I'll come back and start writing the book. I had to start writing the book. And so what that means is, is that, as I said at the beginning, is that a big part of my interpretation of Miles is probably coming from the two movies, particularly the first movie, um, but both of uh, the Spider-Verse movies, because that was sort of the first cohesive view of the character I had gotten as opposed to reading an issue here where he jumps on mm -hmm. the ship that takes him from his Earth to our Earth and then reading, you know, I, I it was... It was just, I had read a bunch of issues, but not a, a bunch of runs, I guess is a good way of putting it. And um, and so I had to, I'm, I'm playing a little bit of catch up, but I felt like the movies gave me a good primer for who the character is. Do you have any familiarity with the um, Bendis crossovers, the two Spider-Man miniseries? Or I, the video I read both of those right out of the gate 
Um, and again, I, I liked them, but they were again very much mentor protege. Yeah. And yeah. And I respect that. And that's a, that's where those two characters started. But as I've probably said ad nauseum at this point, I'm trying now to move them beyond that. Um, so I they uh, are part of their history that's important to me, but it's also something I want to evolve forward. I don't want to just keep them in that spot forever. I want to evolve it forward into something new um, that I think is exciting. Um, and also funny. So I am curious because you mentioned your gargoyles work a couple different times. Is there a difference? Me? I mentioned in... gargoyles. That's shocking. <laughs> shocking. An absolute shocker. Is there a difference between coming into that and coming in where you, where you had such a integral part of creating that universe? Versus coming into this where it's you're coming into somebody else's sandbox, so to speak. Is there a different mentality that you have? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, there's a lot that overlaps. Like I said, it's um, there's great warmth I feel for the Gargoyles characters, great warmth I feel for the uh, Spider-Man characters. Um, that aspect is the same. But there's a big difference in terms of... Um, when I'm doing gargoyles, for better or worse, uh, not in a Seinfeld sense, but I'm master of my domain. Um, you know, I this is my this is my sandbox, <laughs> um, and uh, and I think it's fair to say that literally nobody knows those characters as well as I do. Um, and I think that's very different than coming into someone else's sandbox with characters. Um, and again, there's supporting cast members that I've created, but, but you know, the big mockers in the book, the two Spider-Men, the various villains I'm using, these, none of these so far at least are characters that I've personally created. I've used, some of them I've used before, but none of them are characters that um, I created. And so, you know, you have a, a sort of respect for uh, those who came before, which obviously includes Stan and Steve and Jazzy Johnny, you know. Um, my era, I mean, I'm not, I'm old, I'm not quite old enough to have read the Stan and Steve stuff when it came out. Um, but I, I am old enough to have read the uh, the Lee Ramita stuff when it came out, and that's what that was my introduction to, to Spider Man was the Lee Ramita years, um, and I went back and read all the Ditko stuff, which I adore. Um, but if you're really talking about, and I think this is true for anyone with a long lived character like Spider Man is. It can be heavily influenced by whatever their first impression of the character is. So, it, and for me, that was Lee Ramita. Um, and so I go back to those years in my brain uh, all the, the time. Um, but I've read, you know, gone back and read the Ditko stuff. I've read the, the, um Conway stuff I've read you know a lot of stuff that um Mark did uh you mentioned Mark Mark DeMattis and um uh and and a ton of other writers since then um and some of it I've adored some of it maybe not so much um but uh this isn't my playground like Gargoyles is this is Marvel's playground. Um, for me personally, that means, um, you know, I look to Nick to sort of define where does the sandbox end? Where does it, you know, um, what's fair game? What isn't fair game? Um, but that's not something I'm not used to. I mean, going back to the very beginning of my 
so-called career, you know, writing Captain Adam for DC, you know, I'm in the DC universe. So it's like, hey, can I use Steve Trevor in this issue of Captain Adam? Okay, yeah. Can I do this with him? Yeah. Can I do this with him? No, you can't do that with him. Um, okay. Uh, you know, it. it's a, she. Steve's a Wonder Woman character. So you got to respect that. You can't sit there and go, well, I want to do it. You know, and I don't care what you say. That's, you're just being an, an asshole. You know, um, <laughs> you got to, because there's a writer on Wonder Woman who has plans for Steve Trevor. You've got to respect what that writer wants to do. Um, so, you know, to the extent they let me use Steve, great. And to the extent they don't, I, you know, I've got to respect that. And so, you know, it's a slightly different vibe, not negative, just like um, uh, when it comes to Gargoyles and the Gargoyles characters, there's no one I have to um, dance with, so to speak. Uh, you know, I need my editor at Dynamite and the various people who are giving notes on the book from Disney um, to sign off on things, but no one there is telling me, gee, I don't think Goliath would behave this way. Um, but, you know, I had a line of dialogue for Pete that um, Nick said, I, I don't think he'd say that. And he explained why to me. I'm not going to go into the line specifically, but he explained why to me. And I said, oh, you're right. Um, and, uh, and I appreciate that because I can't pretend I've read everything that Marvel's ever put out, even though I've read a ton. Um, and, you know, my memory isn't as good as it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> um and so you know i forget stuff and and i'm happy to have you know i want to get it right so i'm happy to have it pointed out to me but you know on gargoyles if i forget something that's on me because no one knows it if i don't know it no one knows it i mean the fans will point out stuff all the time where it's like you know uh how did this work but generally speaking i'm i'm uh on it and uh um except color because i'm colorblind but uh, uh otherwise i'm i'm right on top of it i think mostly for the most part um uh but it's different on spying because it's it's their playground it's not my playground i just get to use the toys <laughs> which is always a lot of fun Fellas, you got any more uh, more questions to throw at uh, Mr. Wiseman here? I'm good. Not a question, but I just wanted to uh, thank you for remembering about Starbrand and Nightmask because that was a very slipped on comic back in 2015. So th thanks for remembering it. I loved doing that book. That was a book that started out as an ongoing series that very quickly became a mini series because of pre orders. On the first issue were not what they were hoping for, I guess. Um, and uh, so, you know, when you say, is this an ongoing book? The answer is it is now. Whether it stays <laughs> an ongoing book <laughs> depends on how many people buy each issue. So, uh, um, you know, buy the book, pre-order. That's what really matters, pre-order. Yes, go on uh, Amazon, Kindle, Comixology. It's all the same thing. Or go to your local comic shop and ask them to pre-order it for you. Subscribe yeah. to right. it there. Support yes. su go. support local business and also get some good comics. That's always a good thing. Mm -hmm. It's a win-win. Um, I've got one last little thing, uh, Greg. It, taking off like the, the professional hat, the writer hat, and putting on the fan cap, what would you like to see them do like for the movies that is there like a certain storyline or character that they haven't touched yet in live action that you just that would make your day to see that become a reality well the answer that immediately springs to mind is shashan because that's who we were talking about <laughs> the last hour um uh you know i uh i i don't know i don't i I, I'm not big on second guessing other uh, people's creatives. It's just not how my mind works. Um, you know, evaluating how they executed it 
that I'm, I could do in spades, <laughs> uh, but I wouldn't <laughs> because I want to work in this town again. But, uh, but sort of, uh, you know, I think the point that we see is that you can take almost any character, no matter how silly they might seem on the comics page and go, look what you can do with this character. Um, I think a good example of that in my work is Sportsmaster um, from Young Justice, who was kind of a goofy villain. Um, and we figured out a way uh, between uh, the design of the character and, and, and how we chose to write him to make him an incredibly effective and even frightening um, uh, impressive villain. Uh, in the second Spider-Verse movie, I mean, who would have thought Spot, you know, the Spot would be like, who's going to be the big threat? The Spot. Really? You got to be kidding me. The Spot? <laughs> but, but, oh my God, the Spot, of course, he's phenomenally dangerous. Um, that is a frightening superpower when you think about it for more than 10 seconds, right? So right. on one level, I kind of feel like, yeah, I could name a bunch of characters that I personally like, but it's all about execution. You know, mm -hmm. it's all about, um, you know, you can argue, uh, I'm really fond of Sandman. I'm really fond of Hammerhead. Um, would Hammerhead play in live action? I don't know, it'd be hard. You know, he's, uh, you know, what plays in the comics with him might be a little goofy in live action. And yet, you know, you execute it right. And suddenly, you know, people are going, oh, yeah, Hammerhead, he's the greatest. Um, I mean, go back to the Joker. There were, there were decades when the Joker was just a silly ass villain you know not originally yeah. and certainly not you know once guys like danny o'neill or steve Englehart started writing him and then and the people who came beyond that some of them i think went too far overboard uh with the character uh but but there were literally like 20 years when he was just a goofball and you could never imagine what heath ledger did with that character, you know? Yeah. So to me, um, there's a real uh, separation between the notion of doing something, the idea of it and how it's executed. Ideas are a dime a dozen. And when you're talking about borrowing from something as deep, rich, and with the breadth that the Marvel universe has, even just the Spider-Man corner of the Marvel universe. Um, there are hundreds of characters you could lift and go, let's do something with this. And you could do a really great job with it, or you could do a really lousy job with it, you know? Um, and either of those things are, are possible. Um, it's about execution. At the end of the day, it's about execution. The ideas matter. I don't wanna make it sound like they don't matter. But if you don't execute, then they won't matter. Um, so I'm going to, going back to your original question, just settle on Shashan. I really want to see them do Shashan. <laughs> you, 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 brought, you brought up, like, you know, any character can be a great character. I was so excited for that Hypno Hustler movie because it would have either been the greatest thing ever or the worst thing ever. <laughs> Yeah, that's <laughs> now we'll never know. And now I'm upset. That's a, that's just uh, a stretch because of the name. I mean, even just getting past the name is hard. But yeah, sure. It could be great. It could be great. I, I it can is. dream it's about execution. So, you know, you go in on the silliness of the name and then you do great things with it. And yeah, sure. Why not? Uh speaking of the Spider-Verse movies, we've mentioned this a couple of different times, but how cool was it to see a version of Spectacular Spider-Man? with Josh Keaton voicing him for the cameo was how how that make you feel when you were watching it in the film in the movie theater so um i knew from josh that he had recorded that and i was 
beyond thrilled for him. So I knew it was, you know, the question became, yeah, but did it survive? Is it on the cutting room floor? Or is it actually in there? So I, um, you know, when I went to see it, I had a lot of anticipation. Is it going to be in there? Is it not going to be in there? Will it be in there for a half a second? And then, you know, and I had no idea. Um, I am of two minds on it. Um, on the one hand, the, and this is just me being honest. This is not a comment on the filmmakers. I love both those movies. I want to make that really clear. Um, but what I will say is, is that as great as it was to hear Josh in the movie, I did not for a second buy that our version of Peter Parker would have um, taken Joaquin's side on that taken uh wait that's not his name it's uh miguel 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 yeah sorry miguel's side on that joaquin who i know co-directed the movie that's why i got <laughs> mixed up um uh yeah i didn't buy that miguel would come down and try and convince um miles to let his father die i didn't believe that for a hot second We've had in our show the whole thing about um, there's a scene in our show where um, Black Cat asks Peter to just look the other way for her father when they're breaking, yeah. when she's trying to break him out of prison. And Peter makes it very clear no never again i'm never looking the other way again i don't care what the consequences are i'm never going to do that again so i cannot fathom our peter parker from spectacular siding with miguel against miles over the idea of letting his father die for the sake of the canon now i don't know where the third movie's going I've got no input. I, just to be very clear, I'm not in contact with these people. I have no <laughs> input on this whatsoever. I don't know what the end result is. I don't know where this movie is going. What I know is that the Peter that we wrote would not take that side. Um, I think I can buy that there are plenty of, in an infinite universe of Spider-Man, there are plenty that would. And I can buy that right next to the Spectacular Spider-Man universe is another one that's almost exactly the same, so close that it's also voiced by Josh Keaton. <laughs> and the main difference is that Captain Stacy had black hair instead of white hair for some goddamn reason that I couldn't <laughs> figure out. Um, and so how I made this work for me in a movie that, again, I really liked a lot was I just said, this isn't ours. This is the one universe right next to it that still has, that is so similar that, that the voice still sounds like Josh Keaton, but is with a Peter who isn't, who could be swayed over to Miguel's side. I don't think our Peter could have been swayed um, to that side. I don't think our Peter would in a million years say to Miles, I'm sorry, it's horrible, but you've got to let your father die. Our Peter would have been one of the guys at the end of the movie right. jumping through that hole to help Miles. Um, and it's not like I expected that. It's not like I'm like, oh, Spectacular should have a much bigger role in this. I, I was pleased that they, again, did anything with it at all. And I'm thrilled for Josh period um but yeah i had mixed feelings about it because i i didn't i felt like if you watched our show carefully you would not have made him the mouthpiece for that moment um you would have right. done right. something else with him but not for that moment um that would not have come out of our spider-man's mouth okay. it's a nuancey thing I, but that's how i, I feel I, about it 
No, I, it's I, I'd seen you kind of talk about it online, but I, I hadn't heard anybody like a- address that with you, like like we just did. You could, you could I actually didn't yourself, ever yeah. talk about it online. Um, never talked about it publicly before now, and the difference is, is that on a tweet, I didn't feel I could. I feel I felt like it That's would just right. be taken out of context and 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 make it sound like I was bad mouthing the movie. This could. With a clip, they could probably do that still here, but at least <laughs> in the fullness of Don't this podcast, this. you get the context of what I'm saying. I love these movies. I truly, I can't tell you how impressed I am by these movies. I produce animation. I know how hard it is. And what they have done is beyond the pale. Like the logistics, we talked about logistics before. The logistics of doing the movie that they did first one too but the second one is is just i it i i can't even fathom it how how you, you you're not simply doing a different art style for each world you're doing a different art style from scene to scene you're doing different characters and different i, I it is a nightmare to contemplate as a professional a nightmare and yet they did it and they did it wonderfully um yeah it is insane the level of detail in that film um again in the first one too but then the second one ups the ante on that by i mean exponentially it is nuts and they pull it off i am i i can't say how impressed i am with that movie so the fact that i have a personal stake in one character one version of one character and i have a nitpick about it that's all it is is a nitpick it's uh but and so i felt here i could talk about that in context uh, but i have not done it before because on twitter i just felt like it would sound like i was bad mouthing the movie and i don't want to do that i love that movie right 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 that that's what i was meaning when you were talking when i said talk about it earlier you kind of said you now now that you've cleared that up i apologize um one last question concerning the two artists that you've worked with, that you're working with Umberto right now and, and and Sean Galloway. You talked about how Umberto makes the characters move and have the movement of the characters and the acting. It, was it kind of, were you kind of getting vibes like like you did with Spe- Spidey with, with, so far with Umberto? Is, it, is there a similar feeling with that because of the way their art styles are um, kind of similar? I don't see their... I don't know that I see their styles as that similar, although now that you mention it, I I guess I can see it a little. Um, I, I think what was different is, is that um, we needed Sean to give us designs that were clean enough, that were still iconic, but clean enough that Vic Cook and his t- teams of directors and story editors and the animators overseas could make those characters move. So I think what's common is, is I need Spider-Man to be a character that moves, whether it's Peter or Miles, whether it's the TV show or the comic, this has to be a character that moves. Um, and so the trick for, for, for Cheeks was how do you design a character that still reads as iconic as something that Ramita or Ditko drew, you know, mm-hmm. is recognizably Rhino or recognizably Doc Ock or recognizably Lizard, et cetera, et cetera, and certainly recognizably Spider-Man. And yet do it with enough simplicity that the animators can handle moving this character without lines just bleeding all over the the screen, right? Right. It's a different challenge for Umberto because for Umberto, the trick is how do I take a still frame and create the illusion of movement? Um, those are two, as similar as they sound, those are two very different challenges. Um, and those are two phenomenal talents 
<coughs> excuse me, um, achieving the same end result in someone's brain, right? Um, right. In a, a right. viewer's brain, a reader's brain, the end result is the same. You just get that feeling of vibrancy that Spidey's on the move, you know, but how you accomplish that for animation and for comic books are two very different um, challenges. Uh, and uh, But I've been blessed to have on the show uh, Cheeks and Greg Guler doing designs, um, uh, tremendous directors uh, like Jennifer Coyle uh, and Troy Adamitis and others doing the directing, Vic Cook himself, um, great storyboard artists like Adam Wick and others, Sahan and others, and then um, animation that brought all that home. Uh, that's hundreds of people. <laughs> On the comic book yeah. side, it's three. It's um, Umberto doing the pencils, Victor doing the inks, um, and Delgado doing the uh, colors, um, all working in concert. But it's a different kind of challenge. Um, and uh, uh, But the end result is still the same in, in the viewer's or reader's brain, you know, is that sense of vibrancy, that sense of movement. Well, uh, I do want to give you an opportunity also to, if nobody, anybody else have any questions, feel free to jump in. Well, um, I, I, this, this is kind of a, maybe a dumb one. Um, I know that uh, Ramos, Olazaba, and Delgado there, of all- there are, there are no dumb questions, only dumb questioners. Oh, okay, awesome. I'm one of those, let's go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I assume they kind of just kind of all were, I don't want to say assigned to you, but um, I know that they've worked together a lot in the past. Um, I think they've almost done every single project together. And I just wanted to know if they kind of, when you got uh, Ramos, if the rest were kind of just came along with them. They were all on board before I was the last piece of the puzzle. Oh, okay. Um, so I, I mean, you'd have to ask Nick Loeb the answer to that question. Um, uh, by the time I got there, you know, again, he, Nick is like, so, you know, he was, I'm not kidding. He was like trying to talk me into doing the book and I'm trying to interrupt him to say yes, um, <laughs> uh, all along. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, we didn't go into who was inking and, and coloring the book, um, in our first conversation, but I was, uh, you know, he said Umberto Ramos, and I'm like, yes. And he's like, and we'll do. And I'm like, yes. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like at some point, I was like, dude, take answer. yes for an answer. I'm, I'm, I'm on board. I, I want to do it. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, the, in terms of the art team, was all set before I came on gotcha. board. Uh, gotcha. I just felt lucky. Greg, hobby. Any other final thoughts? I'm actually um, good. I'm really looking forward to this. I talk to him all the time. Let the others talk. <laughs> Not so much a, a final question, but I just want to say thanks because my fiance does not really like animated things. There's exceptions, but I think it was before Homecoming. I had her sit down and we binged Spec Spidey on Blu-ray and she loved it. And it oh, helped thank having... You. Thank um, her. Yeah, it, it helped having like people that she likes like Robert England and um you know some of the other cast members but she adores that show and I just wanted to let you know that because it's it's hard to reach her on that kind of thing but she really dug it and we've watched it twice now so thank you for That's that great. I appreciate it well, I appreciate it, it, yeah. it, it in that same vein um uh, thanks for coming on. Um, I've been a huge fan of your work for a very long time. So getting the chance to talk to you was kind of a lightning in a bottle dream come true. So thank you. Oh, well, well thanks for having me. Uh, I, I do have some, you know, some stuff I'd like to promote if you can. Yeah, no, that, that, that's what that. I was about <laughs> to, I was <laughs> literally <laughs> about to give you the floor. <laughs> Greg, please pick uh, your stuff. Great. So, uh, 
Thursday, I don't know when this is coming out, but uh, Thursday, January 11th, uh, we've got a okay. Kickstarter starting up for Gargoyles that um, is going to collect um, three uh, reprint volumes. One has all the old Marvel Gargoyle comics from the uh, time of the show in the uh, uh, early mid 90s. Um, one has the SLG run of Gargoyles that I myself wrote uh, around 2006, 2007. Um, and then one has the six issue bad guys spinoff that SLG published that I wrote, um, also from 2006, 2007. And all these issues have been out of print for a very long time. Um, all these issues are very, very hard to get. Um, some of them were never printed as individual comics ever. Um, and, you know, to find them now on eBay, I'm told costs, you know, to collect them all costs a few thousand dollars. Um, and so uh, check out Kickstarter, look up Gargoyles on uh, any time after January 11th or starting January 11th. And uh, please, you know, have... help us. Go ahead. I'll, I was going to say we'll we'll have the link to the to the Gargoyles Kickstarter in in the description when this video comes out. So and That's the audio great. as well. So, uh, so click on that link, and um, you know, jump in. There's a lot of great rewards. Um, uh, there are all sorts of price points. Um, each of these three volumes, there are three versions of each. Um, they run from, uh, you know, normal sort of what you'd pay for a trade to ridiculously expensive, but very high quality. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, go for the version that works for you, but please go for something there because these are, uh, the Marvel stories are a lot of fun with uh, um, some great writers like Marty Pasco. Um, the some of Amanda Connor's first work as a comic book artist were, was, um, in those early gargoyle stories. Um, so the art is pretty stunning. And then the SLG stuff, these are stories that are canon to the universe, uh, the gargoyles universe. Um, they fill in the gap between the end of the 65 episode, two seasons of the gargoyles TV show and these dynamite titles that I've been writing since December of uh, 22. Um, and so these are stories that you, if you're a Gargoyles fan, you really want to have. So I really recommend that. Second thing I want to uh, sort of plug is, of course, the Gargoyles comic itself. Gargoyles issue 11 just came out. Uh, this is a 12 issue here in Manhattan arc for Gargoyles. And the 12th issue comes out uh, uh, in about a month, but in any event, make sure you've got all of the first 11 issues of Gargoyles. This is how I got the Spider-Man gig. Someone reading Gargoyles and going, this guy knows how to write. Uh, <laughs> and then we have the spinoff comic, the prequel, Gargoyles Dark Ages. The fifth issue uh, comes out, I think, next week. It's sort of weirdly previewed early for reasons I don't quite understand, but... Uh, um, it comes out shortly, and so make sure you've got at least the first five issues. That's a six-issue miniseries. Um, I'm really proud of uh, all these. And we also had, back in October, a Gargoyles Halloween special that you may want to see if you can find. You can certainly find it on Kindle Comixology, but you might be able to find it, uh, you know, Amazon, but you might be able to find it uh, in stores, too. Um, and... Uh, so get all those and then of course in march pick up the spectacular spider-man west oh yes. gargoyles quest well, that's right gotta, so uh after thank you greg <laughs> duh um after here in manhattan and dark ages ends we immediately launch into a uh, five issue miniseries gargoyles quest um, which uh, is about Demona's quest to gather the three keys of power uh, in order to triumph over the human race and the clan's attempt to stop her. It's a big story. 
that we're telling before we then uh, relaunch Gargoyles uh, again uh, after Quest is over. So we are on a roll with Gargoyles. Oh, and one last thing uh, for Gargoyles fans, for Spider-Man fans, for Young Justice fans, um, we have got, I'm gonna be at a convention uh, called Convergence uh, over the July 4th weekend, 2024. It's in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It is the 30th anniversary of Gargoyles and we will be celebrating that there, but we'll also be doing panels on Spider-Man and Young Justice there. Um, Tom Adcox, who's been in all three shows, he played the Tinkerer on Spectacular Spider-Man. Um, he plays uh, the Witch Boy on Young Justice. He played Lexington, of course, on Gargoyles. He'll be there. Keith David, um, the voice of Goliath, uh, will be there. He also played, uh, for one episode, uh, Tombstone, uh, the big man in Spectacular Spider-Man. And uh, in Young Justice, he was Mongol. He'll be there. Um, Zara Fuzzle will be there. Um, she's the voice of Sherry in Gargoyles and uh, the, the voice of Halo in Young Justice. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. There'll be a lot more guests. Um, so if you're a fan of any of those three shows, but especially Gargoyles, we are having the official 30th anniversary celebration of Gargoyles in Minneapolis over the 4th of July weekend this year. So, you know, I highly recommend attending. Convergence is a great con. There'll be a lot of other stuff going on as well, but it'll also be the 30th anniversary of Gargoyles. That is and awesome. I think that's it. Um, and if you have, if you, <laughs> if you love listening to Greg and Greg talk to each other about Gargoyles, there's also a great podcast called Voices from the Erie, a Gargoyles podcast that we have here on the channel. We're very proud to be the home of and uh, thankful for both of you guys. Um, oh, yeah, it's not just us talking to each other. It's also my co-host, the indispensable Jennifer L. Anderson. And we found out once from experience that podcast kind of sucks without her. That's true. <laughs> and we have a lot of other guests, too. We've had a bunch of different voice actors and uh, artists and, and uh, composer and all sorts of people from the show. Uh, it's a great lineup. It's not. Uh, I mean, I do talk a lot, as you guys have noticed, I'm sure. but. Uh, but we also have a lot of other great guests and, and uh, check it out. Yeah. And, and also if you want to hear more about spectacular Spider-Man spectacular radio, as well as we mentioned earlier in the show, um, of course, thank you again, Greg, for coming. This has been a, a lot of fun. I, I cannot wait to see Sashan on the page and. Uh, <laughs> well, and you'll have to the, wait uh, till issue one. Oh, just just the first issue. Okay, all right, great. I don't have to wait very long. Uh, <laughs> not the first page. You'll have to read oh, okay. more than the first page to get Shashan. Is there going to be a J. Scott Campbell Shashan variant cover? Can we count on that? <laughs> that would be lovely, wouldn't it? <laughs> Greg, Greg I, I don't know. I, I, I've seen Umberto's covers, but I haven't seen any uh, alt covers yet, so I don't know. Well, thanks again for being on here. And uh, of course, we'll we'll uh, do our standard outro, but thank you again. We really appreciate you, Greg, and, and uh, looking forward to all the stuff you've got going on. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Anytime. Once again, thank you to Greg Wiseman for being a part of the network and doing stuff with voices as well as Spectacular Radio. We really do appreciate it. We're looking forward to that Kickstarter as of this being released, it's already funded and it's continuing to blow through. There's another 30 days as of this recording uh, left. So it literally met its goal within hours of it starting. So it was really, really cool. They've got some really, really great exclusive bonuses. Again, link will be down in the description below. Of course, if you want to be a part of the show and you want to uh, be a part of our podcast network and have your voice heard, you can certainly do that in a couple of different ways. You can leave us an email at the email address Spidey Dude Radio Network at gmail.com. You can always leave us a voicemail, 818 925 6631. Be sure to leave it under three minutes and let us know what show you're calling about because it's the voicemail line for all of our shows across the network. So if you like a show and you want to leave a voicemail, you can do it that way. You can also find us over on Twitter slash X at Spidey Dude Radio. You can find me on Facebook at Spidey Dude Network as well as Instagram.com slash Spidey Dude Network. 
Uh, and then, of course, the YouTube channel. If you're not already watching us, if you're listening to this on your, the audio edition, you can find us at youtube.com slash Radio Network. Once again, we want to thank our patrons, as I mentioned at the top. You'll see them on the screen if you're watching us live on YouTube. Thanks again to those particular people. We really do appreciate it. And if you haven't already, give us that like, that share, that subscribe. We will see you next time here on the Spidey Dude Radio Network.